All right. Welcome to the November uh, interim. Um, we, uh, uh, I'm Lou Berger, Kent Watson is here. I think Joel may or may not be here. Um, the information's been on this meeting, been announced on the list. There really hasn't been much changes. Our focus is going to be on uh, system defined config. Just have a little administrative stuff to get out of the way first before I turn over to Kent. First is note well. Uh, I think everyone uh, on the call is pretty familiar with this. If you're not, please visit the link at the bottom of the page, the ITF note well. The, um, uh, it covers how we uh, governs our procedures here, and uh, both in terms of everything that you're saying here becomes part of our public record. And as I mentioned, we're recording and the recordings will be published. And we also have um, some guidelines on how we interact with each other. We are using WebEx. Obviously, if you're here, you know that. Um, we're going to try to keep things a little uh, informal. We're going to start out with the plus Q, minus Q, but um, Kent is going to be running most of the discussion. And I think he's OK with people trying to uh, jump in if they really think they need to. Um, but let's see how it goes, uh, keeping it less formal. But uh, we'll also, if you do want, uh, I'll be watching the queue. And you can say plus Q, and I'll interrupt at some point in case uh, uh, Ken doesn't recognize you. Um, the blue sheets are on the um, what used to be Code EMD, which replaces uh, uh, Etherpad. It's called HedgeDoc. The link is, you should see the link. I'll repeat it here again. Uh, uh, join, uh, please join that link and go to the bottom of the page, add your name. If you don't, we'll type it uh, anyway because we do need to keep a record of who attended. Uh, it's really, it would be very helpful if once you're there to help, to stay there and help capture any of the discussion that goes on. You don't have to capture the material on the slides, but the discussion uh, is, would be helpful, particularly if you say something at the mic and you want to make sure your comments are captured. Our agenda, it, the list is pretty short. Um, we have two hours. We've structured it with um, uh, uh, Kent has put together a set of slides based on the list discussion. And uh, I think we're going to try to keep that pretty interactive. But we also have time at the end uh, for any other uh, open discussion. And uh, so that's it. With that, Kent, you're up. Okay, thank you. Give me a moment to start sharing slides. All right, I'm gonna go full screen. So you should now be able to see the slides, do you? Yes. Excellent, thank you. All right, so um, as Lou mentioned, today's topic is system divine configuration. Uh, it was uh, a thread that we had a lot of attention on the mailing list, and it seemed, uh, I think actually it was Jason's suggestion to, uh, you know, have an interim around it, which seemed like a great idea to the chairs. Um, this topic actually stems out of a draft that was an individual draft that was posted to the NetConf working group but it was uh, deemed as uh, really being more Yang uh, modeling oriented. So we there was a you know thinking that net mod working group would be the better uh, working group to process it. And so essentially, uh, we're waiting for a an update to that draft to be posted to the net mod working group. It would be a zero zero draft, um, obviously because it's a different uh, title. But also, um, it's pending being posted until after, you know, uh, comments from this interim have been consumed and incorporated, and and so uh, it hasn't been posted just yet. As Lou mentioned, um, you know, I, I'm okay with a. Well, first off, I'm full screen, so I cannot see the chat window if there's a plus Q or a minus Q. I, Lou, I, I mean, if there's anything like that, I, I leave it to you to. Kind of interrupt me if as needed, but uh, I'm also very okay with kind of just leaving this as you know. If you have a question on your mind, uh, at least <laughs> you know, wait till I get to the end of a sentence and then uh, you know interrupt me. That's fine. Um, 
There are 17 slides, but I think at least three of them are title oriented slides and really don't have content to speak of. Uh, so there's really 14 content slides and we have two hours. Um, and, you know, so for enough time for discussion, I think. The slides are broadly organized in uh, two sections. There's a first section, which is regarding objectives and kind of like the goals and, you know, the design around what we're trying to, uh, not, the, not the solution the design, but the, the, the scope of the work that we're trying to focus on. And the second half is uh, broadly regarding uh, solution considerations. And, uh, and we, you know, iterating through various forms of solutions that were discussed on the list and, you know, kind of bringing to bear why some are better than others and, and whatnot. Uh, there is actually at the very end uh, also a concrete example coming from uh, Junos. Uh, not that this is specific to Junos in any way, but uh, it, I have access and, uh, and could, you know, pull out a concrete example. Uh, it's something to think about if necessary. Mm, okay, so um, as mentioned, uh, a, a lot of data was collected on the mailing list. There was over 40 plus messages there. Um, thank you to everyone who was involved uh, in, in order of appearance, Kupang, Balaj, Andy, Frank, Jurgen, Jason, Chin, and Jan, some of which aren't on this call just yet, at least they weren't when I started. Uh, so I don't know if they've joined since. Uh, this, these slides were put together, uh, you know, basically notes were taken while rereading that entire thread. And, and then uh, these note, this presentation was put together. Um, and I, I did collaborate with the authors, uh, being Chen and Qifeng, who are on the call right now. Um, you know, so they um, guided, you know, uh, some of the presentation slides here uh, as well. And as, uh, as and some of you may notice, your words are going to be in these slides. Uh, I definitely, you know, copied and pasted some text directly from that threat from those threads. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, objectives. So first, I, we want to enable systems to do a better job uh, documenting that which they do already. A standard mechanism to see what system configuration is available on a server. Um, we, we all know that such configuration exists, but how to access it and how you know, the client access it is, is that we don't really have a mechanism for doing that just yet. Uh, there is another high level objective, which is to avoid having or avoid the client having to copy system configuration and running whenever possible. So, you know, there's some discussion about, you know, uh, the running data store must always be valid. Um, and a way of, you know, and leaf refs need to be resolved and therefore system configuration needs to be um, copied into running. Uh, so we'd like to avoid having the client needing to copy anything into running. Um, so that's a high level objective. Thirdly, support configuration of descendant nodes of system defined nodes. And I think actually it was Andy who wrote this, uh, the well-known interface problem. A system configures almost empty physical interfaces. Like this is for an appliance, for instance, a, a fixed appliance with, you know, say five ports. Of, uh, and, and so the ports themselves are fixed. They're, they're system defined. But we want to allow the client to configure uh, things underneath those uh, port definitions, you know, to specify parameters like MTU or whatever. So um, continuing on with, uh, which I think is Andy's statement, the user is allowed to add, modify, and delete all descendants except for the name and the type leaf, which are set by the system. So here's this uh, third objective, which again is to support the configuration of descendant nodes of system defined nodes. And then fourthly, and uh, Jason, I think this was from you. From you, uh, oh, wait, Jason is in queue uh, for when you get to the end of the slide. Oh. Okay, well, uh, I can, uh, let me get to the end of the slide here and, and then I'll take that. Thank you, Liv. Yeah, end of slide's good. Yep. Okay, so, and then fourthly, a readback of running should contain just what was set by clients. Um, of course, we, we, you know, this is, we've been saying this for years. We always want to be case that that running is, is uh, you know, there's nothing happening underneath the hood. 
Um, that said, actually, interestingly, I did uh, find we, we uh, as a working group or IETF or whoever, there's already a known exception to this in RFC 7317, where the crypt hash type is defined. It, I, the description for that text actually says if the client uh, passes a, a password effectively uh, that's prefixed by um, dollar sign zero dollar sign, uh, it says when such a value is received by the server, a hash value is calculated and the string, uh, we can see it, um, a cipher string is appended to the result and this value is stored in the configuration data store. So, so here is actually the one and only exception or existing exception that I'm aware of where we uh, support the ability of running, changing um, under the hood or not being exactly what the client sent. Um, okay. This is the, that's the end of the slide. Uh, who, who had the question? Uh, I, just a, a couple notes on this one. It's Jason Stern. Um, you mentioned that's the only exception. I guess I guess another exception is the type leaf in that interfaces node because I think it says it's mandatory, but it can be set by the server. So you're, uh, I think for some interfaces, um, you can create it by the client, and the server could fill in that leaf. So in theory, you're reading back something different than what was sent. That's maybe another another okay. example of that. Um, but I would, to be honest, I know we do have a couple of examples, but I guess overall, I, I'm still of kind of the opinion that, yeah, we may have a couple of very specific examples of those, but it still seems like a very desirable goal um, to have running kind of be um, client controlled. Um, the the other thing I want to mention just at this high level, Kent, I don't, I don't know what fits into objectives, but I think we should also keep configuration templates in mind when we're discussing this point about is running valid? Because that's another big kind of looming discussion that I think we may need to tie in a little bit, at least as far as, you know, are we going to allow this this work we're talking about today to possibly say that running doesn't have to be valid? And if it does, you know, what does that mean for templates? And, and if we say it does have to be valid, you know, what might that meet for configuration templates? So we can maybe get into that a bit later, but I, I just, I know for me in responding to some of this, I always had those in mind as well about how that's gonna affect that part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Um, also, uh, if uh, folks can try to uh, enter these comments into the notes for slide three, uh, slide numbers are at the bottom of each slide. Um, to your first point, I agree, uh, even though we have these couple examples, we shouldn't uh, view this as um, an open, you know, uh, a gaping hole that we can go through and like, okay, now we never does running have to reflect what, you know, clients, but I, th I think it's that desirable goal, as you mentioned. Um, with regards to templates, I did see your post to the list um, and about, you know, how, what you just said exactly. And uh, so these slides don't talk about templates in great extent or really at all. I don't think the word template shows up anywhere, uh, though I completely agree with you uh, in that, you know, as we're talking about the solution considerations, which is later on, um, you know, this, this whole notion of, you know, does running really need to be valid? And, and but in the world of templates, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine that, you know, it's not actually um, intended that's being validated as opposed to, me. so I do agree. Uh, were there any other comments? I guess not. So just on, on that point, um, yes. I guess, you know, what I've seen in some implementations is that effectively the server is validating intended. Um, and that seems to be the behavior of at least a number of systems I've seen out there. Which is which works for when the server is kind of the master validation, but is problematic um, if you want to do offline validation of instance data against uh, of running instance data against the model. So yeah. you know some some common clients do that and should be that should be a in theory by the standards a, a valid uh, operation to perform offline validation. Yes, so it's yeah, it's a thorny problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I did mention I, the word template likely doesn't show anywhere in these slides, but the um, example that I mentioned of being at the very end is effective, effectively a template. And, uh, and, and so we can kind of look at that and say, well, of, you know, 
how how was it that this was actually becoming valid configuration and, and being coming you know validated? So well, I think we'll talk about it a little bit when we get there. All right, next slide. Um, axes of interest and and you know so <laughs> kind of a strange title, but you know in a in essence, uh, what kinds of system configuration data are there? You know, broadly it seems to be three different kinds of nodes. You know, those that are inactive until reference, those that are immediately active, and those that are conditionally active. So we'll go through each of these one at a time. Uh, inactive until reference, you know, so here we have like predefined objects. Um, some examples might be, you know, and, and these names are like application ID could probably mean a different thing to different systems. Uh, anti X signatures, I, I mean, again, probably, you know, I think that's actually a little bit more uh, uh, global um, you know, understanding of what that might mean. Uh, trust anchor certs, so certainly this is a global. So for trust anchor search, you know, think about your your uh, root public trust anchors. Um, so you know, in the configuration, you can imagine somewhere there being a list of trust anchor certs, and surely uh, each client could populate that list. But you know, um, or really in, for all of these, uh, as a convenience to the clients, the vendors decide to pre-populate uh, those lists. Or some uh, some entries in those lists. It, it can be a a, a heterogeneous list. Uh, some entries supplied by the vendor, and then some additional entries being supplied by uh, clients. And um, and so you know, and and for some of these, like for instance, the application ID, uh, an example of that might be SSH, and and the definition for that application ID would be uh, you know TCP, you know protocol TCP port twenty two. Um, so. And there's, you know, and in and, and, and some systems I'm aware of where these application IDs are defined, there's hundreds of them. And, and so it's a real convenience for vendors to be able to pre-populate um, all these things. And, you know, every application or not every application, but, but every client um, is going to want the same, the same kinds of application IDs being defined. So, you know, why, don't, why doesn't the vendor just go ahead and define them? So again, these would be inactive until reference. So they're being defined by the system and they're just sitting there, but they're not actually being applied. They don't they don't go down to applied configuration, but until they've been referenced, uh, it's a, like a leaf ref. So until the client uh, leaf refs it, it's not yet uh, being applied and not yet active. So inactive until referenced. Next uh, category is immediately active, and so some examples here might be some fixed uh, interfaces I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, like an appliance. It has uh, five physical ports, so you know there might be fixed interfaces, and those are immediately active. They're already active, um, and, but you know, and the and and so here I'm just briefly touching some solution considerations. And again, there's a whole section about solution considerations coming up, uh, so I don't want to get rat hold in the on this point. But uh, it's notable that these immediately active system defined configurations really can't be in factory default because factory default is used to initialize running and anything there can really be deleted by clients. And, and you know, these are not meant to ever be deletable. On the right here, you'll see this a possible immutable extension. Um, you know, there's a way where we could have configuration that was flagged with an, an annotation, uh, something like immutable that would effectively declare as read only, even though it ex was uh, being shown in running. I have a whole slide uh, on this immutable extension coming up, but and and beware, this notion note of an immutable extension comes up in two more places in these slides. So there's that. Um, okay, so then so not not in factory default can't, that doesn't quite make sense. And then also it can't really be an operational only. Um, uh, you know, certainly all system configuration is an operational, but but what if the node hasn't been um, applied yet, you know, to the other, you know, to the first bullet point, uh, inactive until reference, until things are actually been uh, applied, they don't exist in operational, and therefore, there wouldn't be that ability to um, copy them. So, so anyway, uh, now, and then lastly, the, the third broad category or axis of interest are these conditionally active system defined configurations, so even pluggable cards. Um, I, you know, in my mind, this is kind of like a win expression, but the condition 
is is on a system resource. So it's not really on, you know, uh, like when, you know, XPath is normally to another bit of configuration, but here it's more like a, like a, on, on a system resource. So when a card exists, uh, then some additional configuration appears. Um, and then, you know, one question is, well, again, kind of like with the previous comment, I was dipping a little bit into solution considerations. Uh, what, well, why wouldn't this be an operational uh, with origin equal system? I mean, of, already, you know, if you conditionally plug in a card, uh, then it's going to show up in operational with origin equal system. So, you know, it seems like we might already have the solution in hand. Um, but the reason why is that sub bullet point, because some sub nodes are configurable. Uh, that that thing that uh, that quote from Andy that I mentioned earlier on the previous slide, where um, you know the fixed interfaces exist, but you want to enable clients to configure some sub nodes, it can't do that if it's an operational, and that's why. So again, broadly, three axes of interest, um, and I'll just pause here for a second. Any comments on this slide? Rob, go ahead. Okay, uh, just to say that assume all my comments are as a contributor, unless I say otherwise for this meeting. Um, just on the first one, the trust anchor certs, do you, is it possible to overwrite a trust anchor cert? Are you, you cover the case of adding an extra one, like merging two lists, I understand that, but can you either overwrite one or remove one through configuration, or is, is it always the case that the ones that be added by the system have to be there and have to stay there? I'd say it's possible to overwrite it. I mean, and, and maybe this varies by vendor, but but generally, um, I don't think it'd be possible to delete it, but because it's you know system defined, it's like built in, it's read only. But but you could certainly define another having the identical name, and the leaf ref would probably resolve to that one as opposed to or or should resolve to that one as opposed to the one that was defined by the system. Um, and I, I and I believe that's even. Uh, the, it uh, you can actually do that today in Junos. I, I mentioned earlier the example at the end with application IDs. So they they do define some application IDs and they prefix all of their application IDs with Junos hyphen. Um, but I don't believe there's any restriction from a client defining his own application ID that just so happens to begin with Junos hyphen. Um, I didn't try this myself, but uh, I guess that's kind of the question you're asking. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else? Yeah, sorry. I was. I also. Uh, I went back in the queue there. It's Jason again. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess. Um, Rob, or uh, um, Kent, one thing you mentioned, which which also, uh, um, uh, kind of resonated with me. You mentioned that sometimes uh, vendors predefine, you know, potentially very long lists of, of items on, so that as a convenience factor. And um, I know, I know, in, in in the Nokia implementation, we have some things like that. And if those were all to show up in the running by default in an empty system, it would be very cluttered. Agreed. Um, so that's why I I, I kind of see this idea that you don't necessarily, or there, or certainly, it's to be considered. Like you may not want all of this user built-in stuff to just always be appearing by default. It could be could be a huge amount of clutter. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is. The inactive until referenced uh, immediately active. For me, that's a, a tricky concept because I'm, you know, there's 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 two two things that could mean. One is, you know, do we mean like active in the operational app layers, like actually being used, or do you mean active as in shows up as part of the config? Because those are maybe two slightly different things, and I I'm not sure if we sometimes. Are bouncing back and forth between those two concepts because I know we've talked about hey for the system config you could maybe have it suddenly appear in the running once it's referenced and that's that's what I call kind of um, not so much inactive until referenced but at least not in the config until referenced and then there's you know is something actually used in the operational layer obviously it's not used there until it's it's referenced so I'm not yeah. okay I'm yeah sure. I think I, I think I meant more the um... Uh, it active in the sense of applied. So, you know, maybe in, you know, not applied until reference, uh, immediately applied, conditionally applied, you know. Like applied as in showing up in, 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 in the it, config or you're just uh, like- Applied as in, as in uh, ultimately going, you know, through intended down to operational data store. Okay. 
like like a commit operation. I, I think that's what I was really thinking about. I know what you're saying, which is, you know, are we talking about it just appearing in running or not or, you know, appearing in running? But that's not what I'm trying to. No. Uh, okay. Okay. And then the last thing is um, there's some discussion about whether the system config should be overwritable versus modifiable. I I know again in 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 Nokia implementation we have we actually have two classes of these these items um, the the non deletable ones some of them which you can so you know we pop pre populate a list entry like a quas policy or could be mm -hmm. an interface and some of them we allow you to go and modify the the ancestor uh, sorry the descendant leaves mm -hmm. and some of them we don't so I think we'd want to keep this discussion open to allow two cl both classes of those things personally I think there may be some system ones that the um, server designer does not want to be modifiable. Right. Yes, I agree. Uh, Lou, Thanks. as contributor, I think that last comment was really important because it also covers the pre-provisioning case, you know, where you have a, a, a line card that's not yet plugged in, but you still want to allow configuration on it. Hmm. Okay. All right, very good comment. Anything else? Okay, moving to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> system change outside software upgrade. So really, it's, here I'm saying uh, the system-defined configuration. Is it possible for system-defined configuration to change outside of a software upgrade? Um, so, and you know, specifically regarding conditionally active system-defined configuration, like pluggable cards. Uh, so there's, you know, there was this exchange on the list uh, where one member wrote, "Quas function is enabled. Many Quas predefined policies are created by the system." And then uh, Jason, I think this was you. I agree there can be dynamically added system config, uh, create a new Quas policy, and some queue entry are automatically created inside that policy. Um, so, so I think that the net net is there's an agreement that that which is considered system-defined configuration can change dynamically. Uh, for instance, conditionally active configuration when you plug in a card. Um, so it's not, it's the, the, while the data store is not editable in a, like an edit config perspective or a client edit config perspective, it is modifiable or editable through um, physical actions like plugging in a card or maybe installing a license or something like that. So um, at the bottom here, the takeaway I think for me is that uh, it, you know if we agree that system config can change, then there needs to be a mechanism to notify clients. Um, so Yang notification, of course, would be needed. And also, uh, I, I do think this notion of like an e tag or a timestamp, uh, a thread that we're having elsewhere with Jan. Um, uh, could be used as well, right? Where a client is, you know, you know, it's trying to do an edit config, and it's assuming the system config is a certain thing, uh, and maybe it can pass an e tag or a timestamp, and and then discover, oh, it's it's not quite the same as it was before. And so, in addition to maybe receiving a Yang notification. Next slide. Uh, system. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I should ask back. before it. <laughs> Um, just a, a, a couple things on this one. So uh, the one you quoted from me, just there's a little subtlety around this one. Um, I guess I mentioned this because I can't remember, sorry, one of the authors of the draft, I think, was asking for other opinions on whether there's dynamic. So I, 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 I do think there can be a concept of dynamically created um, config, but I think I was looking at that as orthogonal to, okay, um, that's a separate question of should it show up and running? So, yes, I think there can be system um, created config dynamically, but I'm still very, uh, you know, I'm not too sure it should just show up and running. So I think I just want to separate those two things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, agreed. And, and I think we're tiptoeing up to that line. So here we're saying system config can change. And then later we're going to talk about, but how does system config become uh, visible and running, or or is it a data store? And you know, so then we'll we'll flash back to this slide and say, well, you know, it needs to be uh, dynamically changeable. So that's something we keep in mind. 
Yeah. And then uh, the other thing that, um, I mean, I was first thinking that this Yang notification on a system config change maybe is overkill for, I mean, there may be hundreds of lines that are not being referenced and maybe we would only want to do that for reference config, but the example you gave may, that, that, that may be relevant that may, if, if a client has kind of somehow pre-learned what the system config is and expects to be able to reference it, and it, even though it's not yet referenced, maybe you're right, maybe it would make sense to keep the client up to date on changes of the, even the unreferenced system config. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, then next slide. System defined nodes are not deletable. So uh, I did mention this before um, that, you know, I, I think the system defined configuration is, is uh, read only from a client perspective, uh, but let's hey, Kent, uh, Kent, I'm not sure if Alex came in on this slide or the previous slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. I came in on the previous one. Yeah, so basically, it's just another, uh, just another case. Uh, I wonder uh, actually if you if you have considered that as well concerning the autonomic control plane, and basically that might in the future perhaps be another uh, um, source of system changes. So I think if mm. you're discussing this, that that's maybe another thing to to consider if something comes from the uh, some yeah autonomous control control plane uh, type function. Yeah, that's a good, uh, that's interesting um, comment because, you know, my, when we were saying that, I was wondering, you know, would, would autonomic control plane instead be a dynamic data store, like, uh, like SDN type? Would, 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 the, do you think that it would make sense to use a dynamic data store or would it be a system data store for autonomic? I, yeah, so I don't know. I, I think this is a, well, uh, it's a, uh, uh... I, th I think it is certainly something that needs to be that needs to be distinguished from some of the other cases that we have. Yeah. Uh, I would assume, yeah, maybe it's a it's a network system <laughs> type of thing, uh, or so to to say. I, I have not really thought that through, but I think it is a valid question to 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 think about. Yeah, I think, I'm, and, and I don't have this in the objective slide, but at least, uh, but but your question kind of susses out the subtlety here. Uh, at least in my mind. The notion of uh, what the vendor can describe as being a system configuration is somewhat static. Uh, while the contents might change dynamically because you're plugging or unplugging cards, um, the the uh, global scope of you know everything that system config can done is kind of known at the at the time of uh, manufacturing or when, when the software has been released. It, like the the complete you know like ha the full you know very all the possible variations are known. Uh, whereas I think with autonomic control plane, there you're dealing with more like uh, data traffic, you know, traffic data, and it's you know which IP addresses and which you know all this kind of stuff is very dynamic. Uh, I think that's a kind of unknown as a it's yeah. not it's not so static. It's not canned. That's right, but it's it's unknown right now. But clearly, uh, clearly, I think at this point there are there are not many applications really for ACP. But in the future, it might uh, it might certainly basically extend to what we would today just basically uh, assume to be regular uh, system management type type of operations, which would not be part of other control protocols. So. Uh, anyway, I just want I, I just wanted to raise that. Uh, raise yeah, no, that as it's a good point. point. And Alex, if you could, um, you know, keep an eye on that comment, like as we continue uh, with this, not not this presentation, but with the draft and and the solution, um, you know, let's let's keep that comment open. Sure. All Thanks. right. Jason is in queue. Go ahead, Jason. I, I mean, just to comment on the on the ACP. I mean, to be honest, to me, that does not sound so much like config, unless there was policy or knobs controlling how the ACP is operating, but the ACP itself sounds a lot more like state or at most a dynamic data store. I, I'm not sure that would cause stuff to be reflected up into configuration. Okay, yeah, noted. And, and I think that's kind of what I was saying as well. And this is Lou in Q as contributor. Um, I, I really agree with uh, Jason. You know. Uh, ACP, if, if you have an agent on the box, it's sort of like just like another control plane protocol. If you don't have an agent, it, to the rest of the system, it looks like management. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Let's try uh, this. Alex is Alex is back. <laughs> I, 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 I just wanted to respond to to to, to Lou. Yeah. I, 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 
Well, uh, I agree. At some point, it's of course like just another control plane type of operation. But I do think actually ACP is potentially, uh, yeah, it's still different, right? I mean, somebody will want to to do. Uh, I I can very well imagine that you would want to be able to differentiate where, for instance, some some changes and so forth are coming from. Whether whether it is from the ACP, which is more dynamically freely programmable, I would assume some of the function that you have there. Uh, versus just a regular yeah, control protocol, which is just part, uh, part of the function of the network where it's expected. Um, uh, anyway, so I think I think uh, yeah, I think it would be good to uh, to keep that in mind just to see if that is something that needs to be distinguished. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I think it is it is slightly different from from a regular control plane. Yeah, uh, just just to respond, I I, I think it's um, not a new class of thing. I think we have existing classes that it can fall into um, as opposed to something completely different. So I'm not sure it needs a special case. Uh, that's me as contributor, now as chair, Rob is in queue. Um, so just a clarific clarification question to Lou. So you said ACP would be another control plane protocol. I was thinking it'd be another management agent sitting on the box. Is it, it could be either. It depends on how it's implemented, right? Because it's a yep. flat, broad uh, class of thing. Fine. Okay. Yeah. I think I think it could. Be, you need to look at the actual implementation and decide which one of those two it is. Fair enough. Uh, it might even show up as a different user. By the way, it could not even. You know, it doesn't even need to necessarily have an agent, right? Uh, I guess if you if you modify the configuration, you want to know you'd have would have something associated with it, some identifier. Right, but people are using northbound interfaces today with automated agents, and they just you know have some sort of authorization, and it goes under that authorization. Oh, sure, yeah, just like any other management clients off the box. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, tried slide six again. System-defined nodes are not uh, deletable, and so you know this is the whole. It's uh, read-only effectively. Uh, I just want to verify sort of a, an axiom and a corollary, if you will. But uh, so first, you know, any deletable system defined node uh, could al alternatively have been defined in factory default. So it, it, if, in, if it wasn't truly the intention of the vendor to publish uh, some configuration that was deletable, that was intended to be deletable, then why wouldn't they have just put it into factory default? Uh, and then the sub bullet points is that, you know, already factory default uh, nodes are deletable. And of course, uh, already any system defined ancestor nodes um, uh, would need to be copied. Okay, so I'll, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the end of course. Let me restate that second bullet point. Um, if if someone were to uh, try to copy, um, actually just forget the whole second bullet point altogether. It doesn't, it's not holding together very strongly. But the point being is that um, the, uh, it seems to me that if the intention was for it to be deletable, it would have been in factory default. And and so here's yet again another reason for why we can't just be talking about items being in factory default. Um, the corollary to the previous statement is that any deletable node is modifiable. So it's kind of like a tr uh, a strength test, right? I mean, if you know, if I can edit something, does it mean I can delete it? If I delete something, does it mean I can edit it? So I'm, I'm kind of making this statement here that if you can delete something, then clearly you're able to modify it because um, you could then delete it and then recreate it, right? So you could just delete the thing that was provided by the vendor and then create your own, uh, in effect, completely modifying the thing that was provided by the vendor. So the statement is that anything that's deletable is modifiable. And there's really no need to limit that modifiability. Uh, you know, it's not like, um, you know, uh, like which of the sub nodes, uh, you know, and so, I mean, we talked earlier about the name and the type, uh, descendant nodes as being not modifiable and, and anything else is modifiable. So, you know, but for the most part, if they can delete it and recreate it, then, you know, I've, I guess the name itself, the name itself is the key. So you know, they would have to be using the same name and. And so they're not really modifying the name and the name is fixed. The type is potentially, I mean, maybe they could use a different type and we don't want to allow that. So, um, but for the most part, any of those descendant nodes of a system defined node are completely modifiable um, with the caveat of the ones I just mentioned. 
Any comment on this slide? Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I just like to su fully support this. Like, I'm, I mean, other than subject to NACM, mm -hmm. but assuming we just put NACM aside for this, like, fundamentally, I think the discussion we're having today is about non deletable. For deletable items, I totally agree. That's that's out of scope. That's the factory default stuff. Perfect. I, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's basically we're trying to define the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, you know, and and the scope is I don't think we're re trying to focus at all, at all on on nodes that this vendor wishes to release that are uh, deletable by by clients. Does that make sense to anyone? Any objections to that statement? I don't think so. Moving to the next slide. Uh, system defined nodes may be modifiable. So, so uh, <laughs> they're not deletable, but they might be modifiable. Uh, it, so, you know, it, again, that notion of a descendant node, uh, add, you know, addition modification may be allowed, but, but some of those descendant nodes may be, you know, pre-populated with default values of sorts. And, and so, uh, yes, uh, the vendor, you know, it didn't, it, 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 the vendor didn't just have uh, no, no descendant defined. The, the descendant was defined and it had a value, but it was fully meant to be modifiable by the client. That was, um, and again, there's this comp to, oh, why can it not be in factory default? Um, but there's that business again with the immutable flag. So if it were in factory default, then of course it could be modifiable uh, unless, uh, the working group were interested in trying to define a special extension, potentially called immutable, that would uh, signal to the client or the server would be telling the client like this node uh, in this list or whatever is, or or as a descendant child of a container is not modifiable. And again, there's a whole slide on this immutable flag coming up. So uh, hold for that. Uh, so an example of a modifiable but not deletable node Imagine a mandatory true leaf with a system specified default value. Right? It's mandatory true, it must exist. Uh, so even, you know, the system configuration has to define a value, but it's just, you know, it's like a default value. And here I mean default, not in the Yang uh, statement sense of the word, but, but just that if the value has been specified. Um, but you know, clearly, uh, you know, client could change it, but they can't delete it. So that's an example that we can go with. Any comments on this slide? I think you have two in queue, uh, Rob, then Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So my my question is actually, uh, why are why why were we considering factory default for this at all? Isn't isn't the scope of factory default quite different in terms of this is just what the device would have when you were to completely boot it up from scratch from fresh. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the reason why it's coming into play is because, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of a solution consideration, something that people threw out in that uh, thread that we were having with many responses. And, you know, uh, so factory default configuration is configuration that's been specified by the vendor. So in that sense, it has a lot in common with what we're talking about system defined configuration. Uh, but, but uh, you know, that, and so that's why we're talking about it. It's, it's a potential solution, um, you know, but it, it's not a viable solution unless, in my opinion, uh, unless uh, there were something like an immutable flag. Oh, okay, but even with an immutable flag, I'm wondering if that still wouldn't be mis misrepresenting what factory default or change what factory default is meant to represent. Yeah, well, and then also potentially there's a uh, uh, an, an intention mismatch, right? So, and perhaps this is more to what you're saying. Uh, factory default is very, very f static. It's only there for when uh, reboots or, you know, f when resets have occurred. Uh, and here in, in an earlier slide, we were talking about a system defined configuration can actually change dynamically, uh, you know, and we might need Yang notifications or an E tag. Uh, so, you know, clearly uh, factory default is very static uh, with respect to that dynamicism that we'd be seeing in that other case. So I think that's yet another reason why is we're not, we can't really be having factory default as a solution consideration. Okay. Yep. Did you say you had two comments? Was that 
one. Yeah, I also had one, I guess, just about the second part here. Um, the, the mandatory true leaf that can't be deleted but can be modified. Like, I know, like, Yang doesn't allow one of these at the top level of a data model. Um, and I can't remember whether it's allowed in a, in a nesting of non-presence containers either. I think maybe not. Um, I guess what... This this concept, Kent, are you are you proposing that this would be allowed? This type of concept would be allowed at the top of a data model, or or in something that only has ancestors that are NP containers? Um, wouldn't that go against seventy nine fifty? Even if you had this kind of system specified, I'm not sure population of it. Yeah, so I I'm not saying anything about it being top or or within any data tree. It, uh, okay. Maybe I'm not even sure if I understand fully what you're saying, but my my statement here is not uh, intended to be uh, reflecting where in the data tree it might, where the mandatory true leaf might show. Okay, up. okay, it's independent of that. All right, fine. Oh, oh, okay. I think I I know what you're saying though. We don't want uh, mandatory true at the top because that means a um, an initial config would be immediately invalid, right? That's the reason why. We've... It was that, and I'm just wondering if this concept of the system filling it in was intended to now suddenly allow that to occur in a data yeah, model. Well, I, well, I, mean, I think it, it, it could, and, and perhaps it should. Uh, so, but because the, it, the uh, a completely uh, fresh, um, empty even, uh, running, uh, at least from a client perspective, uh, would, would still have a system configuration which would have this mandatory true leaf with a value specified and so the validation would succeed it should succeed so i, th I think the, there could be a relaxation with regards to this kind of mandatoriness occurring uh, at the top of a tr data tree in, in for system config jan is in queue well, yeah. that, uh, the, <laughs> that validation they just talked about now would only work on the device itself because uh, in an offline situation you wouldn't have that system config probably. And uh, I'd, I'll just add that uh, mandatory true at the top level or in NP containers all the way to the top is unfortunately allowed by 7950. Uh, it's just the recommendations that say that it's not a good idea and mm. it definitely isn't. Um, sorry, what was the first part of your comment there? Right, that you said that uh, you could have a mandatory true leaf there and it would still work because the system config values would be in there in running anyway. But in an offline situation or by oh, manager or uh, something like that, yeah. they would not have that, so they wouldn't be able to. Right, okay, I remember. the So offline validation, um, and, and this was a, 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 one of the focuses of the topic of the thread that was online before, and uh, certainly something that's um, top of people's minds. The solution consideration section, uh, which we're almost uh, about to enter, uh, kind of goes into uh, how offline validation can be supported by various solutions. So, um, uh, so let's let's I guess hold off on on going down that comment just a little bit further until we get to those slides. Okay. Excellent. Next slide. Um, and and this is kind of like you know back to our objectives, right? We wish for this solution to have no impact to operational. Um, as always, system defined nodes will appear in the operational data store with origin equals system. Full stop. There's, there's everything we're talking about today and any RFC that might get published out of this work should have no impact to operational as we fully, under, as we understand it today. Um, second bullet point, this work enables a subset of those nodes to be defined like config, uh, yet they still appear with origin equal system. So it's like a subset of uh, operational nodes to be defined like configuration. Um, so, you know, again, we're not, we're not impacting operational. The nodes are already showing up in operational. We're just trying to tease out some of those nodes. Cause right now, some of those nodes magically appear in operational. It's, it's, you know, they're not directly from running. So how do they get in operational? So it, that's what we're trying to tease out. We're trying to make it possible that 
maybe not all, but more, certainly, hopefully most of those magically appearing nodes that are coming to operational are now actually being defined uh, in a way, uh, you know, that they're, they're, they're made visible to clients prior to them having to uh, get uh, operational and, and checking for those nodes that have origin equal system. And the last bullet point here, existing config false nodes are not impacted by this work. So, um, you know, in all of our, you know, operational contains a combination of config true and config false nodes. Here, the scope of this work is really only the, those, the, those nodes that would be config true. Anything that would be config false, it's not within scope of this work or any RFC that might come out of it. Any comments on this slide? I, sorry, I just jumped in there last second. Um, I guess I I didn't look carefully in in preparation of this of, of to to refresh my my understanding of the system from the NMDA, but um, are you are we sure we're not precluding Kent that we this this the system that's defined by NMDA is is exactly one to one with the system config we're talking about in this meeting like. I'm not. I'm not sure. Do you want to preclude that we might this this new system stuff in this meeting today might end up with a a new or different origin and system? Maybe. I. I mean, I did um, consider it, and I didn't share these thoughts online in our. But you know, privately, I I, I kind of thought through this. Um, it. I. I. Uh, I couldn't bring myself to feel like there was strong enough use case for actually defining another origin other than system. And in fact, it, the more I thought about it, the the worse of an idea it seemed. And the but more uh, strongly I felt that you know it really should be origin system. The things that we're talking about. Okay. I mean, you might be right. It's just uh, I, it, in some ways I'd be slightly surprised that what we defined with the NMDA exactly matches. Well, maybe what you're saying is it's close enough. It would be confusing to have something different for them. Mm, yeah, uh, partly that as well. I mean, I, I think, you know, for the title of this slide is, is almost, uh, I really want this to be the case. Like if, you know, that, that every client's understanding of what operational is, is not being affected by this work. Uh, that would be a very helpful outcome if we weren't to, you know, start tweaking things there. Um, yeah, and, although a new, you know, a new yeah. concept could also introduce a new origin. Maybe that's yeah, not necessarily terrible. Yep. No. No. But but there's value if it doesn't if it doesn't. Yeah, so I think there's it's valuable if it doesn't. Hopefully okay. it doesn't have to. But point taken. Um. And hopefully a note taken as well that you know, this side side is sort of putting down you know uh, an opinion. But certainly uh, we it's subject to uh, discussion and uh, if needed, um, we could discuss the potentially having a different origin value. Okay. Any other comments on this slide? Everyone agree that we're focused on config true nodes only, that we're not really talking about config false here? A any system defined configuration would be a config true node, never a config false node, right? Of course, I think. All right, next slide then. And I believe that was, uh, so we're transitioning into solution considerations. Uh, let, before I do that, let me just pause for a second. That in, in the scope of like, we're in the discussion of s objectives and scope and, is it now clear? Is there are there any more comments about what it is that's trying to be achieved with this work? This is Alex. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I think it is clear. But uh, one thing, just on the on the earlier comment that you just made to, uh, regarding the uh, other original, uh, the comment that, that Jason was making. Um, uh, would it be possible to potentially also introduce a new NMDA data store? Actually, I mean that would be for, for factory defaults or, or what have you. Um, I mean, I think that that, that this potentially uh, possible other option. Uh, exactly, and in fact, uh, as one of the solution considerations is exactly that to define a NMDA data store called System, and then we can go through what that might look like. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Um, and so I think I'll just move into solution considerations. 
All right, so one one solution uh, consideration that was thrown out there was, you know, can we use factory defaults? And and the big takeaway in red here is, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough of a of a solution for us. Uh, it, it is good. I mean, there's pros, right? The good is that it's uh, a deletable system to find configuration, um, but most system configuration is not deletable, unless of course we had this notion of an immutable flag. Um, you know, we again we, we can't really define things in factory defaults. Uh, also, factory defaults is not expected to change based on system resource conditions. So this whole business about it being dynamic. Um, so I think we should stop discussing the use of factory default data store as a, a potential solution here. I, it just doesn't seem to be enough of a solution for us. And another solution consideration that, that's been discussed is using operational data store. And again, in red, I don't think it's enough. Um, so, you know, in, in the pros is that yes, uh, all active system configuration is present. So it does actually capture system configuration. It's there, it's, it's, it's you know, it's there. But the caveat is that in bold, it, it has to be active. If it, you know, it's only the activated uh, or applied configuration that's present and operational. All the other, um, you know, for instance, those predefined objects that we were talking about before, um, you know, that vendors might, you know, pre-create as a convenience to clients, none of those would show up uh, if, you know, so, so uh, using operational just doesn't seem to be enough. Uh, second uh, sub bullet point here, uh, but the, under oh, and I just said that the, that's exactly what I said. Um, third bullet point, and some nodes need to be referenced by running config. Oh, yeah. So in addition to uh, it, you know, in, inactive nodes not showing up at all in operational, we also have this desire for um, reference referenceability, right? So a client can edit some, some configuration that might contain a leaf ref, and that leaf ref is actually referencing a bit of uh, system defined configuration. Well, if you know, we already have this case that you can't, you know, one data store can't leaf ref into another data store. So if if the data were only an operational, then the leaf ref and running it, it doesn't work. It, it, we don't have that mechanism, and I understand that we're kind of creating a new mechanism here also. Um, so why can't we just apply the change that we're applying here to operational? But that seems to be going too far. Um, so using operational uh, directly also does not seem to be enough of a solution. Uh, before going on to other solution considerations, next slide. Uh, is any comments or do any disagreement with this, these statements? Um, Kent, uh, Jason here again. Mm -hmm. um, I so I definitely agree with number one. I, I don't I, again. You know, we confirmed before we shouldn't be taught. Like in my opinion, deletable config is not out of scope of this whole discussion. Um, for number two, I'm I'm also doubtful it's a full solution, although. I'm not sure if necessarily part of, part of this work wouldn't end up showing all of the system config in operational. Oh you yes, that only active, but oh, I see. Part, I mean, part of what we come up with here could have all system config referenced and unreferenced show up in operational potentially. Yeah, potentially, and and honestly, it's not defined uh, by uh, NMDA or or any other work. Um, you know what. So certainly that which has been applied or active is, is shows up in operational, but there's no real statement about, well, what about the config that's not applied? And you know, does it show up in operational? And yeah, I think it could it, if we want it. Could, to. It could, in theory, it could. There's no reason or there's no RFC that says it can't. Um, but if I were a vendor um, and I was you know, writing the code for applying, because remember you're pushing configuration to data plane. And then when you show operational, you're you're presumably reading the data plane and kind of generating the uh, quote config unquote that shows up in as in your response for the config true nodes in operational data store. So so you know if you didn't push a unused or sorry if you didn't apply or or an unused value right didn't get applied to the data plane. So like, and here, when I'm saying data plane, I mean, imagine line cards or whatever. And then later, later on, you do a read back from the line card. Hey, give me line card, give me your configuration. Well, since you didn't push it, the configuration, it doesn't know anything about the configuration. Um, how would you then represent that thing that didn't get it? You know, it didn't. Yeah, I mean, 
I see that in some ways, but let me give you an, an, an opposite example. So mm -hmm. say in a system, you can define quas policies. So I have my quas policies, one, two, three, four. I happen to have signed assigned policies, you know, policies one, two, and four to various interfaces. Um, policy three is still part of my config. I would still see it in intended. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think a lot of implementations would show that in operational as well. I'm not sure they would strip it from the config just because it doesn't happen to be referenced. Yeah, I, I, I with, again, there's no RFC that says it can't show up. Yeah. And so really it's a matter of opinion or, you know, uh, each vendor is kind of free to do it their own, their way that they think. Okay. Uh, I mean, in any case, it's not complete because having it show up down here, like, you know, I don't, I don't think clients are going to want to, well, I don't think we're going to propose that clients should go read operational for the configuration true nodes and use that to validate the config instead of running. Right. So I, I don't think it's a complete, I'm just, I guess what I was just questioning that I certainly want to, I don't think we would preclude that someone can have all of their system config show up in operational if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Right. I, it, it could, and, and then they may, um, but I don't think it's the solution that we want here because it's too, um, uh, variable as to whether or not all vendors would do it the same way and interoperability from that. Okay, uh, next slide then. Uh, so the um, third solution consideration is to use running. It says three variations, but now there's only two. So excuse my uh, not uh, updating it. Uh, so, two, so two variations. Uh, one variation is to copy from operational via explicit client action, um, like an edit config. Um, so first off, remember we had a top slide objectives where it kind of violates that statement. We we're, we're hoping to not have to support copying anything uh, into running uh, to support the solution. Um, but then the caveat also is that uh, the sub bullet point there, uh, in in my mind, and in per, per that comment that Jason just had, but at least in my mind, only the active configuration would appear in running in operational. So if you're trying to copy things that didn't actually even appear in oper uh, operational, then how would you, where are you copying them from? <laughs> they don't show up in operational until you've, you know, put them in running or at least in intended and, and, but you can't put them in intended and, and you know what I'm saying? So catch 22 um, is, is at least unless J as we, Jason was saying, um, everything shows up in operational and excuse my dog with a squeaky toy in the background. Uh, and then B, a second variation of using running is, is this notion of implicitly hidden nodes. And when within this, there are two sub options. There's implicitly hidden, uh, and then they can be made visible through some sort of like, for instance, a with system parameter. So you're doing a, a get config or a get, and you say, you know, also give me the system, you know, config. And, and so the system basically, uh, you know, gives you a response that's a combo of of all running plus system configuration, and uh, so there's this uh, variation. Um, and, I, and my my takeaway is this actually seems pretty viable to me. Uh, I think it's possible. A sub uh, the other options uh, too, um, which are implicitly hidden nodes, but they're hidden by an NACM, and uh, and then they're made visible through proper authorization. So. I'm uh, myself a little bit queasy about this approach because NSCM, at least at this moment, is not mandatory. And besides anyway, using NSCM doesn't quite seem to be the right um, mechanism for how we'd wanna go about doing this. Uh, so I'll pause here for a second. And uh, and by the way, the, the, the fourth solution, the next slide is regarding using a system data store. So it's instead of a running data store. So, but this slide's about using a running data store. Any comments on this one? Go ahead, Jason. Um, yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, I'd expect we should probably have a fair bit of discussion on this, starting now on this slide. Um, a few, mm -hmm. a few initial comments um, on copy from operational. I guess, I mean, I guess copy from maybe the next slide would would copy from system um, as a as a similar kind of analogy, but. 
I mean, any any copy via an explicit action is, I think, is a bit painful because every time a client wants to use one of these, then in order to keep their running valid, um, then they're doing this separate thing to go copy some subsection over. It just seems weighty. Like, I'd like to propose there may be a variant of A that might be a bit more palatable, which is um, uh, use use running and you know client, servers today already accept when you leaf ref to the system config even though it doesn't exist show up in the config and um, the problem like that's great that's fine on the on the server side and maybe even fine for the for the clients the problem is with clients that need to offline validate. So, you know, another variant of the solution could be that for people working in that type of environment, that the server can still validate based on basically it's intended, but, um, you know, you it would you have an option where the client can also explicitly create that system configuration object, at least create the object itself. It doesn't necessarily have to fill in all the you know, for a quas policy, for example, you would at least allow the client to create the quas policy, which would then instantiate it in the running. Um, all the underlying leafs and settings for the quas policy don't have to be visible. They don't have to fill those all in, but then the running becomes valid. And I, I would think that would be a better approach than actually doing some separate copy RPC from operational. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, so I, I resonate strongly with the pain and weighty um, attributions or, or that you gave moments ago. Um, also, keep in mind, uh, maybe, and this is what you meant by weighty, but but um, it, it not only is it, uh, you know, from a performance, like runtime perspective, the interactions is kind of ugly, but also it uh, pollutes the content of running that, that then more, as you said earlier, if, you know, if everything starts showing up and running is kind of, it's it, now your running isn't, you know, you got a bunch of other stuff in it that, you know, you really rather you're running be focused on your business logic or your business yeah. config as opposed to all this other gobbledygook that, you know, the system, the vendor was trying to, as a convenience, hide from you. Um, and but now you're being forced to actually make it explicitly vi visible again. So it's not, you know, as well. I, I agree partially. I like, I think it would be useful to have the at least the declaration of the list entries you're referencing be in running. Oh, so okay. wouldn't be all the noise of the stuff you're not referencing. It wouldn't even have to be the noise of, you know, all the parameters of the quas policy, all the parameters of whatever, um, uh, you know, system interface you've created. But I think it, I, I think one of the solutions that personally, I think is my, my favorite at the moment is actually, it's a variant of this use running, but for in environments where offline validation is important, the client would have to at least declare the system objects they're using and then okay. it becomes remembered a bit like you know like um there's with the defaults has a mode called explicit mode where even if you match the default it shows up and if you in in trim mode if you declare a leaf that's not the default it doesn't um that it is the default it doesn't show up well this is kind of like explicit mode for these built-in objects if you declare them then suddenly they show up in the info, even though they did already exist under the hood for validation. So yeah, okay. So yeah, sure. Maybe uh, it's like a a variant of a. It's, it's I mean, like it's, a and b one, but um, kind of, yeah. If we were to modify a and say uh, instead of focusing on where it's being copied from, just saying you it's know created explicitly, explicitly created, and then it might be copied from our for operational. It might be copied from a system data store, you know, TBD, if we choose to do something like that. But but your point is that it was at least explicitly created. And but um, you say, you know, only the, the subset of the ones that were actually referenced need to show up, uh, which I agree with. And then also you said, uh, maybe not the complete um, uh, subtree needs to be there, you know, if, you know, at least like if it's a, if it's a list uh for instance just the key field uh would be sufficient and you know the remainder could maybe not show up so, yeah i think it would be up like mm -hmm. to be honest at some ways it would be up it would be based on the data model and it would be up to the client to make sure it declares what's needed so if there's a leaf ref to that item then the client would create the item 
um, I think it's I think this is less usual for these types of policies. But if there's a mandatory underneath, then the client would have to also create the mandatory. I don't think that would be as common anyways from these system created type objects, but. Right. Uh, well, and, and certainly. OK, so, uh, so we, we, on that very first slide, the objective slide, we, there was a desire to not have to have the client copy anything into running. So and, and, I, and I know that you said just a moment ago, this is kind of your favorite um, approach. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that there's still a desire, right? If, if it was possible uh, for it to not have to copy it over just to, for the leaf ref to be resolved, then it'd be desirable to skip that step. But the leaf ref still exists. And, and, you know, if you do a commit, a validation error should still be thrown. Maybe not, I mean, offline validation is a different topic, but, but at least from the server's perspective, if the, if the leaf ref, you know, if the server couldn't resolve that leaf ref, um, you know, uh, even if a client didn't, you know, create a stub entry in running, uh, the server could still, you know, discover, oh, this is my system config and I can use it. Uh, so validation succeeds. Um, yeah, so but, I'm I'm sorry. weighing that against. Sorry, just one second. Complete. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, on the flip side, you also mentioned descendant nodes. So if, if the descendant, it, you know, and there was a whole slide previously about the we need to support the ability for clients to be able to configure descendant nodes of system defined nodes. And for those nodes, I am in 100% agreement with you that. Uh, there needs to be a copying of stuff into running uh, because, you know, those those uh, ancestor nodes that were created by system uh, would have to be copied into running in order for the client to be able to configure those descendant nodes in running. So uh, I do completely agree with that part for, for those for the cases when uh, descendant nodes need to be edited. Yeah, I, well, when descendant nodes need to be edited, it's trivial anyways, the operators almost implicitly creating the object anyways, because you have to navigate in into that object anyways to get even to get to the descendant nodes. Mm -hmm. So that's that's less less of an issue. Um uh, I I guess what what I was saying is I know there's a desire to just for free be able to reference these things, but I I think I'm trying to balance that against I think an even stronger desire to keep running the source of truth and valid. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still at the moment leaning towards that's the compromise that is in environments where an operator is using offline validation as part of the tool chain and, and workflow that those operators have to declare, at least declare the list entry key of the item they're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to fill out all the rest if it doesn't, if it's not a mandatory part of the data model. Right. But I, that helps, that keeps running valid. Yeah. yeah. With your B1, that's a variant, yeah. but it would require retrofitting clients to always read with system. Yeah. Uh, maybe, and maybe not. I think there's a combo solution that, 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 uh, actually, my favorite solution is a combination of, uh, 3b1 and next slide um when we get to that one i think i think we can almost have our cake and eat it too uh, but um i will just point out quickly uh, in my other work the trust store draft and the key store draft in both of those drafts there's these notions of um built-in keys or built-in certificates you know things that have been like the idev id key and the idev id certificate uh, built in by the vendor um they're not deletable. It's read only, um, and and in those things, um, and yet it it also talks about like for instance certificates in particular. It talks about well, if you need a leaf ref a certificate, you need to copy it into running, and so it says, and and even goes to the point of saying well, you don't have to copy the whole thing. You just need to copy the the stub entry, the the, the key, the the name, and and you know like and yep. you know, that's along the lines of what I'm talking yeah. to. So it's exactly that. And I and I and I actually have it as an open item and uh, for myself as an author of those drafts to go back and and words because you know they're past work in group last call. But I just want to make sure the language in those drafts don't preclude the ability for those built-in keys and certificates to show up in some TBD system data store. Like like right now, I just want to make sure it doesn't say it's it must be an operational and it must be you know like I just need to just tiptoe around and make sure it's. Uh, 
you know, the language is is loose enough that it allows for uh, these others. But but the point is, I truly understand what you're saying and, and that, that approach. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I thought there would be a lot of discussion here, but maybe uh, people I think Rob's in the queue too. Oh, yeah, I was about to say that. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was just making notes. Um, so yes, I think it's just back on Jason's point. So you're talking about the user having to create the the top level entry so they can be leaf reft. But I, I think there's an option. I think as Kent's probably going to allude to, that you could do it either way. So by default, if you just exist in system, the reference would still resolve and be completed. But if an operator wanted to validate it offline, they'd have the option of explicitly naming those objects to get their um, get the configuration to, valid, to validate offline. So That's think, exactly my proposal. Mm -hmm. So I think so it works sort of both ways. I, and I think that maybe what Kent's going to propose, but I don't know. Yeah, well, exactly. And I, I was going to say, that, interesting Jason just said that's his proposal. I was going to say that's my proposal. Maybe we're all in agreement already. <laughs> okay. Good to go. Next slide, Rob? Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, fourth solution consideration is to define a data store called system. Uh, in green, you say, uh, you can see, I actually think this is, uh, it's in the scope of things that are viable. Um, so, uh, you know, some pro, a pro of this solution is this whole notion of data stores is a standard mechanism. A NMDA defined the notion of data stores. We have, you know, we, we have the ability, you know, the API um, to reference data stores as input parameters and, you know, origins can be used to uh, specify which, you know, so generally speaking, using a data store uh, seems to me like um, something that kind of just fits very nicely into our toolbox. We, we, we have this ability to support data stores. And, and so uh, now I did remember in that thread, Andy said um, he made a comment about the, uh, along the data stores are expensive. Every time you, you create a new data store, you have to deal with uh, a lot of um, stuff. Uh, truly, I, I didn't actually understand it myself, but uh, I want to be mindful of the fact that uh, maybe it's not as um, simple. Uh, but it's, to me, it seems like it just slots right in and and quite nicely so, uh, this, uh, just using a data store. So uh, again, uh, there could be a data store called system. Uh, that data store would be read-only uh, from a client view perspective. But as we were saying earlier, it needs to be dynamically modifiable because maybe a line card gets plugged in. Um, and that's that second bullet point. It says limited read-only RPCs, but data store content is not static content may change by upgrades and or when system resources are met. And by the way, upgrades, you know, like if you upgrade the operating system, so you, know, you go from version uh, 1.3 to 1. You know, or 2.0, um, surely your system defined uh, configuration has changed uh, when you made that upgrade. Um, and then the sub sub bullet point again, uh, that's notion of a Yang notification would be needed. Um, and someone else, uh, uh, I think it was Chen, actually, earlier in this call, I mentioned that I, I previewed some of these slides with, he made the comment that if we were to have a notification for when a data store changed, we wouldn't want to limit it or, or, you know, the solution shouldn't be just for when the system data store changed, it should really be for when any data store changed, um, you know, a generic, you know, data store change notification. And actually, I'm wondering if we don't already have it, <laughs> but, but anyway. Um, and then, okay, so third and last bullet point on this slide. Uh, offline val validation necessitates client understanding how to merge. So there's some, you know, there'd have to be some logic, like how to do that merge of, you know, I have a running data store, I have a system data store, uh, what's the merging logic? And the, the client would have to understand. I don't think it's complicated, but it would have to be defined and clients would have to implement it. Unless, as the sub bullet point points out, uh, there could, there's a workaround, uh, which is the, Use the oh, oh I guess there's two workarounds. So one is uh, from the from the online discussion we were saying well the client could just ask the server to do the validation. Um, so it's not really offline validation. That would be online validation if the server is asking the server to do it. But it's possible, right? Um, and but there is also this notion of offline validation. And I just want to quickly peek. Yeah. So um, there's also the uh, a combination of the previous slide, and I'm just going back to the previous slide. This with system parameter. So if a, if a, you know possibly, um, I mean I think there's two ways offline validation could occur. One would be uh, the client fetches the system data store 
and then understands how to do the merge itself and offline validation proceeds from there. Another would be that client asks the server to, you know, give it the pre-merged um, config and then the, the client does offline validation. Now you can question, is that truly offline? Because the server had to be online in order for the client to get that merged result. Um, and, then, and then the third variant, which is what's listed here, the client could just go ahead and ask the server to do the validation, which again, isn't really offline validation, but all right, next slide. And, and by the way, this slide and the next slide are really part of the same solution to using a system data store. So using system data store continued, um, there was a concern Someone mentioned about debugging the configuration distributed over multiple data stores. And um, so it was thrown out there and, and, you know, I kind of, at first I was thinking, okay, that, that that's probably true. And then I was starting to think about some more and I was kind of, at least for myself, not, uh, it wasn't landing as strong of a concern uh, as I thought maybe it would be. So, so anyway, so in my mind, three uh, things or, or um, caveats or, you know, or if you were to say cons, you know, like the reasons why this concern is not a not really a concern. Um, first, it's a kind of a non-issue for config, which was copied in, into running. So, you know, we, we, I think we've all said that, especially when the client needs to configure descendant nodes of system nodes, that the system nodes would have to be copied into config, into running. Um, well, if it copied into running, then, you know, clearly those, um, you're not debugging across data stores at that point. So for all those kinds of, uh, things that got copied and running, this is a non-issue. For things that were not copied and running, uh, if there was like a leaf ref and uh, the leaf ref resolution didn't succeed, then validation error should explain. I mean, if if you know if you asked the server to do a commit or or you asked uh, the server to do a validate with a candidate configuration, uh, the the validation error should be very clear. It should say, hey, you know, you you got this leaf ref. Uh, you're referencing this object which doesn't exist um and you know so from you know this goes to the debugging of configuration I, i'm actually in my mind the server would you know the validation errors that server's providing should be uh, helpful in in debugging uh, and lastly servers can present a merged expanded intended data store view uh, for clients that don't want to understand the merge logic so this is again to that previous statement the with system parameter that the server, um, the client could ask for a pre-merged view if they, uh, and then and then because then they do have the merged view, uh, they can do the debugging on that merged view. All right, so I think, um, yeah, so that you have a couple of people in queue. Oh, good, yeah, because I was I just a quick uh, peek at the next slide, and and that's kind of where I bring it together. So let me pause here and take the questions in queue. Um, so, so my question. Uh, is oh yes, is on the merge effectively. So you've not specified how you're expecting that to work, but is your is what you have in mind effectively that uh, anything in running uh, is effectively added on to whatever's in system that gets merged together and validated as part of intended? Is that what you had in your mind? Yeah, roughly. Uh, I'd say it's kind of the other way around. It uh, almost like a layer. So first you'd have a system layer. And then you would merge running on top of it, uh, and the point being is that running could clobber or override um, or shadow out or whatever language you want to use uh, some of the configuration that came from system. Okay, so on and on when you say shadow, does that mean that there's some way that you're allowed to hide a bit of system? There's no, there's no, is there any way you could say? I don't want this policy to appear in the merged view. I assume not. I, I'm yeah, I'm guessing not also. That's a very specific uh, 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 example that you gave. But I'm thinking, for instance, if the, if the system had a predefined object with a specific definition and you didn't like that definition, uh, so you want to you know, give a different definition, you should, you, your client might be able to create its own predefined object having exactly the same name and effectively would uh, shadow or, you know, occlude the uh, the same object that was defined by system. Yeah, that's fine. It's more about whether you, when you have those layers, whether you allow explicit delete effectively uh, in a in a higher layer to override, to remove something from a lower layer. I think the suggestion is, is no, you can't do that. You can only overwrite it with a different value. Yes. 
yeah there's no, there's no deletion it's it's just uh possibly overriding it with a different value yes i uh jason here i'm um i i, I agree I, I don't think i don't i don't even see how you would specify how to delete it i and we had talked more earlier that kind of the system is not deletable. So if there's a system data store and there's a merged view of system and running, it's going to include all of the system. I just don't see how maybe overwritten by by running, but you can't mm -hmm. you can't really remove that stuff. Exactly. Um, a, a couple of comments. There's there's um, we mentioned a couple of places here, clients um, and understanding merge logic. Um, so a couple things around that. One is, I, I, I'm going back to configuration groups here a little bit. Um, this is all coming down to whether we want clients to be able to take running as is and have a way for that to appear valid. Um, this, you know, I still think there's a pretty important value in not in having a way to not break that for traditional clients, um, and you know, even the concept of a client understanding merge logic. So the merge logic for this merge may be something we can nail down, but, um, you know, I'm going back to config groups here and what, what we're going to do about running and is running valid. Um, I don't, I don't think it's at all simple to understand how uh, for a client to understand how config groups, for example, go through their logic to produce what the servers then validate. Um, so, I'm not sure if that's that generalizable um, as a general concept. If we're going to have some kind of post running that's, that's the thing that clients validate, I think that's something that has to be read back from the device. I don't think it's something clients can reproduce that logic. Hmm. And uh, could you just say some more about config groups? Well, I, I guess, so there's a, there are a bunch of parts to config groups here that I think tie in with this discussion. Um, one is I've heard I've heard um, some discussion and see it mentioned here for you know maybe clients can figure out on their own you know how a, a running config how config group expansion might work. Um, I was saying that you know there's different implementations of that in the market today and I don't think they're all aligned. I think there's some complexities like for that. I'm not sure it's reasonable for us to say that a client would ever guess at all the expansion rules, especially when we're considering config templates. Like a mm -hmm. few examples, you know, think about user ordered lists and you have a config group that has some entries in it. You have the local config that has entries in it. How do you interleave those? Do the config group ones go at the end? Yes. What, like that's not straightforward. Um, the other thing is if you have a choice construct in your Yang, a choice and you know, the case, one of the cases is selected in the local config and the config group has statements in the other case. Are those ignored? Is that an error? You know, when statements have some similar complexities, I think there's a bunch of complexities with the concept of a client understanding merge logic. And so I think we got to be careful around any solutions where we're saying, or we rely on a client doing validation on some virtual thing that it calculates. Mm -hmm. um, so this this is where I'm struggling a bit as well, bring this all back together. For for this problem we're discussing today, I really still think we want an option where old clients can read the running and it becomes valid. And I don't think the stuff we're talking about here precludes it, but I think I think the part of the solution that I mentioned before, I think in order to achieve that, I think clients are gonna have to at least create the the stub or whatever explicitly in the running. It can mm -hmm. still also exist in, in the system data store. We could still have this with system option, but that's only going to work for clients that, you know, have this new capability of with system. Like, I don't think we want to invalid, or I think we want to have an option that doesn't make running invalid for all these other clients. Right. Yeah, so I mean, and I don't have a slide that speaks to the interoperability of uh, old client with new server that, you know, that uh, which I think you're touching on. Yeah. Um, but I did, I think, on one of the emails, uh, make a, a statement to the effect of, uh, you know, it's almost like what we have today already, you know, clients, uh, 
are already today, um, you know, th those that are unaware of anything system related are, you know, in a way, not even making the leap refs to system defined configuration. So uh, this whole topic is almost mute to, um, I mean, you could almost say it's mute to legacy clients or those that are not um, grokking system, the notion of consistent configuration at all. So perhaps, and it's a subtle, or it's a, it's a, it's a, ten, a, a tenable perhaps, is, if it's true, um, we don't need to worry about that case too much. Uh, that said, um, uh, I mean, of course, if, if client A, you have a server and you have a legacy client plus, you know, a new client and new client configures some system configuration. So it's added the leaf ref to system defined configuring a thing. And then old client um, does, you know, the get. Um, so old client now gets the, the leaf ref, but it doesn't know, it can't resolve. So it's the form of an offline validation fails. So, so there, there's, there's when, I start to say, okay, well, we're dealing with heterogeneous clients and we got to deal with that case. So maybe it is a problem. Um, so yeah, I'll just, throw, I'll just leave it there. Anything else on this slide? Anyone else in queue? Um, what, one other thing, there, there was uh, your second uh, bullet on this slide saying validation should explain misreference objects. Um, the thing is, I think the way a lot of these servers are working today, right, is that um, a bunch of servers are effectively validating, making the validation decision on their intended. So after config group expansion, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're ignoring these ref misreferenced objects. So on the server side, the validation function today is already, I would say, um, not going to highlight these errors. So if we want these errors to be highlighted, like the missing config, if it, like, if they want to be, if we want a validation function that points them out in running, um, it's almost like we'd need a new variant of the validate. I, 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 don't, I don't understand. Um, but let me clarify that when I say the validation error, the, the error would be on the client, the client pushing config to running, uh, you know, they did something wrong with running. Um, it's not that the system configuration itself was invalid. I, I, I assume the system configuration would never throw a validation error that it, that it's perfect in essence, the, the vendor has implemented system. Uh, it's system configuration in a manner uh, that would never throw a validation error. So it's always going to be a client driven validation error. And, um, and so that's one, does that help at all? Is it, were you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like uh, maybe let me, let me just walk through it briefly here. Like, so if I have, um, if we talk about system config, so if I have, you know, an interface that I've created and it's referencing a cross policy that's system config. So it's not in the running, mm -hmm. showing up in the running. The server, to, I'd say a lot of servers today will accept that and say, yep, validation fit, uh, passed, I'll commit that. Mm -hmm. On the client, so so the server sees it as valid. And if you run validate, it'll call it valid. But if you if you then, you know, if you take that same config and try to validate it offline in the client against the Yang model, it'll fail there. Okay, I think I understand your point. And uh, it, basically, your point is that serv uh, vendors are already doing this. In in essence, they, there already is system configuration. There already is this notion of um, you know referenceable objects, and vendors have different ways of having implemented this already. And uh, so, this validation error that I'm talking about, uh, as Jason's pointing out, it doesn't really occur. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, yeah. In theory, it should it should so occur. If you want the server, to, yeah, exactly. If you want the server to do it, we need a new validate. Which yeah. is like you know validate strict running or something. Yeah, I think okay, I see. I, I get, and I let me tease out one point here though is I was actually thinking this my my point here was in um, like if the client was referring to a quals policy with and they had a typo in the name, uh, so the quals policy doesn't really exist. Um, that sure. should fail in absolutely in, yeah in, even existing servers today should they say, what yes. are you doing? like that makes no sense. That's, okay. that, that's the error I was talking about. You, you're talking about uh, whether or not offline validation would work. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So moving on. Uh, to, oh, uh, is there another comment? Yes. So again, I, you may come this later. Talking about the validation, I've always thought of NMDA is really when you make, you make a change to running, you update intended at the same time, 
you validate intended and mm -hmm. then running is valid by implication because intended has been validated. So I, I think we we said that running is always valid in the NMDA draft, but I, I think it comes really down to the intended always being valid. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by so that's and by major implication things. Things. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, that's the crux of this. I, I, I mean, we, we, I, I, that's, that's a bit dangerous guys saying that we just abandon and say running can be invalid. So but, but I Jason, still think there's a way to, to achieve what we're talking about here and allow running to remain valid. But it, it goes back to like, if you have a, a template in yeah. running, mm -hmm. then if, before you've expanded that template, then it can't be valid. Or if you have inactive configuration that some vendors support, if you commented out some of that configuration, uh, when you take that commented out configuration out, it may be valid, but with it in there, it doesn't make sense. You effectively have to do the same steps uh, as we do in NMDA, NMDA from going from running to intended to get to a valid configuration, i.e. template expansion and removing active, inactive config. So it ends up being sort of the same thing. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Jan uh, jump in here. Is Jan in the queue? Trying to say something? Yeah. It might be uh, I, was, I was speaking to mute, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I said that I agree with almost everything that Jason says here. Uh, so that's why I haven't said so much myself. Uh, I need to get to the end of the presentation before the end of the hour or so. But yeah. <laughs> here's, here's something where I need to say, uh, because we have 7950 um, that says that whatever you get from get config must be valid. And uh, if, if you're saying that there are some cases where this, this may not be true, then you're not talking about 7950 anymore. That's at least my opinion. Yeah, I, 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 well, I know in NMDA, um, there's this wordage that running needs to be valid. And I think we zoomed in on it and to Rob's point, it could be interpreted that, well, it's r running is valid because vis-a-vis -vis intended is valid in the same way that um, Rob just mentioned. So I think at least That's for the NMDA draft where it makes that statement, uh, we can kind of, uh, you know, put it underneath the rug um, pretty, pretty adequately. Um, but now, Jan, you're saying 7950 also has a statement that uh, the get config needs to be, what, what is it? I mean, maybe we can take it offline, but if you could actually zoom in on where in the RFC, the quote, quote the section um, that you're referring to, maybe even put in the notes if you can. Um, well, yeah, we, we could, but guys, like, I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the, the, the traditional view is that Run, the expected view is that running is valid. Like, let's call, we can look at the wording, but yeah, yeah let's look at the wording. Called model, it's called model-driven uh, management, right? So, it has to you have the config and you have the model, and that those two together should be what you need, not uh, uh, any sort of guesses about what the server might do to combine various things. So, uh, and I, even for the uh, NMDA uh, spec, I'm quite sure that the intended uh, writing in, in that section was that running should be uh, should be valid at all times but okay uh, you have heard my opinion that's enough i want to get to the end of this presentation yeah, okay. right? yeah. thanks jan and and speaking of uh, there are uh, just 20 minutes left and i think i got this one slide or sorry two slides and then an example from junos which is really just two pages and that's the end of it Oh, uh, stupid me. I, I just, I don't know if you guys can still see my screen. I have to go back into. Um... Yeah, we can see it. We see it. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, everything. <laughs> I made that with mistake once before. Uh, all right. So let's uh, push on. Um, so, so again, I think there's maybe this option of kind of merging some items together. Uh, uh, three B one uh, plus four. So, I mean, well, what if a, a server. And, okay. So I think the. The three B one, where we're where we're talking about uh, providing an RPC with system parameter, um, so a client can get a merged view from the server. Well, okay, so a server could do that, and then optionally, you know, a server could define a system data store. Like, I, I mean, um, what I'm trying to say is, you could you, a server could do both, it, it, it or, or one or the other. It's almost like uh, you a server could do three B one 
and or four. It, 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 they kind of mix and match, they go together. Um, so, so servers must, uh, well, here I say servers must support a width system parameter and servers may support read only. Really it's a may on both uh, points. The server may support a width system parameter and the server may support read only system data. So I, I think it's possible to bring the two things together, allow them to coexist. Um, or the solution, if we went down this path at all, doesn't necessarily have to say it's all one or the other. It could be a combination of both. That's what this Kent, I agree. Okay. I would I would add a third, which is which is and servers. I don't know if it's may or must, but sure, servers should allow you to explicitly create these objects in your running. And uh, yeah. Remember. Well, and and, and I agree. Uh, it, it, I, well, actually, first off, I don't think we can preclude it. Okay. No, we definitely can't preclude it. I'm just debating whether that's uh, may, well, should, or must. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but but there is a must, uh, at least for the case of the uh, configured sub descendant nodes, right? Of a yeah, system. yes. So, so then yes, it has to be. Sure. So that's a must. At least that those must be in running. Uh, so it's a subset of what you're saying. And you're wondering if everything needs to be in running. Well, um, I'm. I, I mean, I'd actually propose my third item in the list is is the must is it's the most important is that servers must remember if you explicitly create um the object that it must remember them that's that's the only way that actually any any client could see this as valid mm -hmm. and the other two could be optional yeah i i, I mean i think that you and jan are kind of saying this uh you know, running must be valid from an offline validation perspective, and and maybe there's a statement in 7950 we can find it uh, that actually says that that's the case. But uh, so I think it's uh, you know we have two different camps of opinions, and that's okay. It it, it helps that we're at least solidifying our uh, the scope of the conversation, and we can focus on these parts where uh, we don't have um, you know not everybody's thinking the same thing just yet. All right, so then at the bottom of the slide, I say uh, any server supporting system should support an RPC to get a merge view, right? So, um, so it's basically, you know, you know, you would think that if, you know, you were a vendor and you're going to implement a system data store, of course, you would provide an RPC to allow the clients. I mean, it's only natural, right? I mean, even in your development efforts, you know, testing efforts, you, you would want to have such a thing available to you. Um, so you wouldn't have to yourself uh, as a client implement the merging logic and and really uh and, and really the statement isn't so much that there should be a rpc to get the with system but really maybe it's rpc to get intended right like we we i mean this so far this whole presentation has not stated or this discussion hasn't stated that there must be an existence and intended uh, for the solution to work but truly uh, rather than having an RPC to get a merged view, I'd rather, you know, with system, I'd rather have an RPC to get intended, which is not only merged from a system configurations perspective, but it's also having any templates that may have been expanded and any uh, objects that were, you know, marked as inactive have been removed. Uh, so in, I think, you know, getting intended data store is a much more powerful thing that and more useful thing uh, that could be uh, provided. Um, so maybe even better than having an RPC with with system parameter. Kent, I, I agree that that last that last point, I was confused at first. I thought you were really saying we have to have a separate new RPC. But I think what you're saying is there should be some method to get a merged view. It might be get intended, it might be get from intended, it might be something, but we need some method. Yeah, well, not necessarily I, a new separate RPC for that. Yeah, I mean, so I, again, my on the slide, the first it says servers must support with. I again, I I kind of backed off and I said, well, really, I meant a may there, but 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 in, in reality, in either case, I'm talk, I'm really thinking about get config with an input parameter saying, you know, with with system. Um, but it's it's still within the notion of an RPC. You're you're it's an RPC. Give, give give me the config. Give me the running config with the system merged in is kind of the, the crux of that RPC. But a different RPC is just give me intended. And and the whole crux of intended is that everything's been merged already. So so it just seems, but yeah, you, there should be some way of uh, any system supporting 
system defined configuration you would think would make it easy for their clients to get the merged view, the complete view. All right, and then uh, so this is the last uh, real content slide uh, minus the Junus example that I have. Uh, what, uh, so it, earlier in this presentation, there was some discussion about an immutable flag. Uh, what is that idea all about? So just to kind of throw it out there because I don't think we've discussed it um, much at all, but the idea is to define a per node metadata flag. And, and this is not schema node, but data node, okay? So in the data tree, uh, a metadata flag uh, using an, uh, you know, 7952 annotation, uh, which is an extension uh, called immutable. And the idea being is that any node marked with this immutable flag it, by the server is read only to clients. So yes, it, you know, you do a get config and you, you know, on running and you get it, but some of the content has been flagged with this immutable flag and you know the the client can try to set it, you know, send it back to the server, and you know somehow changed it. But that I would think throw a, an error. The server would say, "No, I, I'm sorry, but that node was marked as immutable, and you're not allowed to modify it." Um, so that's the, the the gist of this idea. Um, it, it's not. It wouldn't only necessarily have to be in running. It could also be in factory default. We spoke a little bit of that before. Um, you know, that factory default data store could also have nodes that were marked with the immutable flag. Um, so the third or really fourth uh, bullet point, the this solution enables, for instance, a host system to share resources with logical systems, i.e. RFC 8530 logical network elements or LNEs that are read only from a, an LNEs perspective. So uh, it's kind of like the, from the host systems perspective, it defines some resources and probably the most obvious one would be interfaces. And it, it allocates uh, some of those interfaces to a logical network element. Um, but from the logical network elements perspective, um, they, they, they kind of just show up, but they're read only from the, from the LNEs perspective. And so, so, you know, those nodes showing up in the LNEs running, uh, it would probably be helpful, or, or maybe it's not even running. If we do go down the route of system, it'd be the LNE's system perspective uh, view. But anyway, it'd be helpful if uh, those things were uh, marked uh, as immutable. And then, uh, and then last, last bullet point, implementation of this idea may require Yang next. So uh, I think the reason why we're not really pushing this immutable flag is because if we were to introduce it at all, uh, it's almost like we have to do a reset completely on um we, we need a yang next to to introduce this idea properly so that's the reason why it hasn't i don't think we but i throw i leave it there if, if folks disagree and you think we don't need a yang next and uh, or maybe this is yet another reason why we need to get uh go get going more quickly on yang next um anyway so so just some quick comments yes i think it's a yang next issue but i didn't really understand the use case if it's if it's running configuration then i think all of that should be editable deletable by the client because it's the client that controls it so i don't think there should be anything in running that is immutable or un, undeletable from that side and in your on the i think it's the fourth bullet this, this solution enables wouldn't wouldn't that just be like the system data store in that uh lne so effectively, the configuration that you that the host system is writing becomes system configuration in the LNE, and you solve it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and that's why I kind of backpedaled a little bit as I was on that paragraph or the bullet point. Uh, I, I, you have to keep in mind it was almost 15 years ago when I when I defined a mechanism for how host systems could share configuration with uh, logical systems uh, back when I was at Jennifer, and and for that solution, I did effectively create a, an immutable flag. Uh, but we, at that time, had no notion of a system data store. And, you know, perhaps, you know, if now that we're talking about there is a system data store, then yes, of course, the LNE would also have a system data store. And to your point, Rob, uh, it probably makes more sense that it would show up then, assuming that we go down the route of having system data store at all, but it, it'd make more sense for it to show up in the LNE's system data store. And, and, and of course, system is already uh, read-only and we don't need the flag. So uh, I think I'm in agree with, agreement with you there, Rob. Okay, any other comments on this slide?
We only have a few minutes. I, I don't know if it's... Yeah, I think he had uh, Jan in queue and then me in queue. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah let's do that. So, so uh, according to 7950, you can actually basically do immutable already. You can invent your own sort of annotation if you wanted to, and uh, you're always welcome to reject any transaction for whatever reason. So you can always say, oh, yeah, I don't like it and reject it. So in that, from that perspective, you can do this already. Uh, I should say though that uh, this might lead this is probably tempting to say, oh, okay, I have immutable. So uh, okay, I have uh, BGP peers, and I can have a table of those or a list of those, and uh, I can say that those are immutable because, from your perspective, Mr. Manager, uh, they are. Uh, and then I can uh, offer some uh, uh, configuration nodes on those uh, on those on, on the on the list there uh, as sub elements. And then we have this uh, SNMP concept of transient configuration, where the server cannot take a backup of the configuration from last week and apply it because suddenly there's a lot of some of those immutable things have changed and now it's not compatible with that anymore. And uh, that was one of the real fundamental reasons why Yang was invented in the first place. To that was one of the tick items to remove. We shall never have transient configuration again. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, and I think to your point, 7950 doesn't preclude the ability of the definition of an immutable flag, but it's really the rolling out. If if we were to want to have an immutable flag, and we and a, and we were to start rolling it out, how would we do so in a in a backwards compatible way? I mean, suddenly all legacy clients would just be you know foobard. They wouldn't uh, yeah. you know they'd get a do a get config and now stuff is marked with immutable and they didn't. It's not like they passed an RPC flag and, you know, input parameter saying, give me config with immutable, you know, it wasn't like they, they opted into getting that response. It, it just kind of, so that's where it, it breaks backwards compatibility. It seems is what, uh, primarily what I was saying earlier. It would just be used to document what servers are doing today, I think though. So I think a bunch mm -hmm. of servers do already today reject certain changes because under the hood, they don't allow it to be changed. This would just describe that same behavior. I don't think necessarily it would need to change the behavior. Exactly. Maybe a way of describing the, what they're already doing. They are. You can describe this. You can describe what you're already doing by this, and it's allowed already to do that. But you can get into a, a bad place if you're if you're making the, the idea behind Yang in the first place become hard or difficult. I mean, impossible to do. You can go very wrong with this approach. All right. And did you have another a second comment? Or is that it? Anyone else? No, no, that's it. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I was gonna. Uh, I was in queue. I took myself out because I was gonna make the comment. I'm not sure it takes an extension or even a, a yang next. And I think the other people already covered the topic. So. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't. I don't think there's time for us to discuss this uh, Junos example, but it's really exactly what. Uh, and, and these slides are shared if for anyone who wants to kind of dig into it. But it's it's just a uh, you know J Juniper is already doing this. They have this notion of Junos defaults and exactly how they do the magic. I mean, I'm not looking at the Yang, but you know, and, and uh, Jason said Nokia has their own. Uh, yeah. Well, not Nokia, um, sorry, but yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Nokia yeah. does. The, the yes, big Nokia. difference though, the important yeah. difference is Junos doesn't have a leaf ref on their Yang model for it, so it's not invalid. Uh, right, so. well, well, exactly, well, I don't, I, I didn't look at the Yang and so how exactly it's done, but, um, you know, the magic is occurring underneath the hood. <laughs> and just, but the point thing is that uh, in terms of, you know, is this a real problem? In the importance of the problem, you know, th those kinds of discussions should the working group focus. Um, you know, I think it's this is a real problem. It's a real world problem. Vendors are already, you know, looking for their own solutions. I, it's worth uh, trying to um, define a solution for for the working group to focus on. That's my opinion. Um, and you know, uh, and really, with the remaining five four minutes, uh, you know, if we just kind of up level this conversation to a bit. You know, how do what are the next steps? How, how do we First off, are, is there sufficient interest? I mean, we have a draft. I mean, the natural process would be to update the draft and, and then, you know, adopt it. Um, but at this point, I think that there's still two uh, camps and like perspectives as to, especially with regards to um, the uh, must everything be in running versus not must everything be in running. Um, should we sort of try to get past that divide before updating the draft? Or, um, I mean, what are people's thoughts in terms of next steps? I I, 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 don't, can, I don't know. If, uh, can I jump sorry, in as go chair? Ahead. I'm going to jump ahead. in as, as chair, um, just to make sure we're, we we cover that point. Uh, I, I think updating the draft, the individual draft, with the conversation, 
and um, optimally, you can capture both sides and use the draft as a way to document this discussion as well as the list discussion, and then use it to facilitate closing out on the uh, the open issue. And we can um, we could even adopt with the fact that the, there's two um, uh, opposing views that we'll have to work out through the process. Um, so from a chair perspective, it, this is an individual draft, so you can do what you want, but I think that would be very helpful to the working group. And with that, I'll, I'll open it back to the floor. Thank you. I just want to say, I don't think they have to be necessarily opposing. So I um, I think there might be, I just, what what my point was, Kent, is I, I don't want to preclude, certainly don't want to preclude the, the way of making the running valid. Um, and then I guess maybe, Maybe the debate just becomes about how important that is versus the other solutions. Okay. Any other closing comments from anyone, especially with regards to uh, the importance of the problem? Uh, can I just make a quick comment? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's partly an AD hat on. I think this is a, a really interesting topic and a good one to discuss. So I'm pleased we've had a discussion here. Um, I'm happy either as loose just to see this progress through an update to the draft. Um, I'm not sure how much time we'll have at, I, at um, 112. So it may be a further interim on this might be useful, but I guess that depends on how quickly you can update the draft and what the feedback on that is. But, but thank you all for participating in this, in this discussion. Hey, Rob, thanks for closing us out. You, I think you covered everything that the chairs would normally say in terms of an appreciation of the, the topic. And so, uh, yes. in complete agreement. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And thanks, Ken, for pulling those slides together. You're welcome. Hopefully, uh, and again, they are shared um, in the meeting materials for the interim. And uh, to Rob's point, the, uh, the net mod 112 is only one hour long. So, it's not really a lot of time. Um, and again, also, also maybe not a lot of time to update the draft before then. So we'll see how that goes. I, I, I guess, you know, so updating the draft appears to be, uh, um, and, I, and there are uh, the authors, Chen and Kyu Fang are on, um, on, the, on the call. And then maybe others, uh, if, if there's sufficient interest, you could reach out to the authors and ask if uh, you could join them on that effort. And that might be helpful to, to making sure the update uh, proceeds uh, the way that everyone would like it to be updated. Uh, yes, uh, this is Chu Fang. The uh, the co-authors uh, co and contribution I really welcome, and uh, the authors will try to submit the draft before the ITF one twelve. Yes, uh, that would be great, and I think it would be very helpful to the group. And uh, really appreciate all the contribution here, and I think uh, definitely uh, kudos to Kent. Uh, you did a, a nice job of pulling this all together and and running the meeting. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and with bet. that, we should close the meeting. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.